And uh, thank you, Malcolm, for inviting me to share this morning. Walking in the Light is the title for the message today. And John's words that we've just heard, like so much from the gospel, are really simple and yet very, very deep. John writes about light and darkness, sin and forgiveness. And we hold those two in tension. We live in the knowledge that we are flawed and broken, we're sinful mess-ups. But we're also, and this is how God sees us, through the lens of the cross, we are beautiful and perfected and made in his image. And at the centre of that tension, that paradox, is the cross. And it's there that we have the need to recognise the darkness in ourselves. Because it's that acknowledgement and then the repentance that brings forgiveness and gives us access to the light, to that perfected version of ourselves. And that version of ourselves is what God wants for us. And the more we can recognize the poverty in our spirit, the more access we have to the light. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Sin can trap us in the shadows or create a veil that prevents us from walking in the fullness of God's light. And sin is something we hear quite a lot about in church. It's, um, it's not spoken so much about outside the church, I don't think. And I think that sin is a word that can provoke quite unhelpful responses in us. Sometimes we find ourselves vacillating between piousness or self-righteousness about a particular sin, thinking, whew, that's, uh, I would never do that. I don't know how anyone could, um, could be that sinful. Or, um, or the other side of that, we, we, we recognize a sin that is in us and we feel guilty and we're beating ourselves up. We're not actually repenting. Um, we're, we're not returning to the high place um, that is the light, but we're staying in a, a place of guilt and of our awareness of our sin without actually receiving the forgiveness that has been made available for us. The Hebrew word for sin literally means to miss the mark. And I think that's a helpful definition as it captures the idea that to sin, that, that the it captures the idea that if the aim is to be in, in relationship with God, in constant union with him, walking at the center of the light, with the light, then that, that's the bullseye, that's the aim. Then anything that pulls us away from that, that knocks us off that course, or that causes an obstacle to us coming closer to that mark, that is sin. And, of course, it's easy to recognize the sin in our actions, and um, sometimes we're very good at recognizing the sin in other people's actions as well. But largely, I think sin is about our inner life. Our thoughts and our attitudes speak loudly in heaven, and they say often much more about us than our words and our actions. As a man thinks, so he is. And so life might look shiny and fabulous on the outside, but if our central relationship with God is awry, there's a shadow that's cast from the inside out. And it can take honesty and a great deal of courage to allow God to shine his light into the areas of shadow and sin in our lives so that he can bring integrity, so that the, the inner life, our hearts, is the same as the outer life. And sin can be the sin that we have committed against others, but it can also be sin that has been 
committed against us, where we've been victims of sin, where words or actions or the neglect of others is causing us to miss the mark. And dealing with sin and receiving forgiveness is essential. Because when we miss the mark because of sin, we buy into the lie that we are separated from the love of God. And as we know, nothing can separate us from the love of God. But sin creates the illusion of separation and places us in the shadows. And John doesn't talk about sin here. And the Bible doesn't talk about sin so that, because God wants to keep reminding us what failures and how wretched we are he he doesn't we don't the bible doesn't talk about sin because because god wants to punish us and keep us in a place of fear and guilt the gospel is good news that that wouldn't be good news no god doesn't want us in a place of guilt and fear god wants to bring us into a place of deep love and forgiveness And Jesus dying on the cross is the doorway that God has given us to that love. Forgiveness is God's ultimate act of his extravagant love. That's the heart of the gospel. And I know that we understand that, but we can find it hard to receive that because it's hard to believe that in this transactional society that we live in that God would do such an outrageous act he would give his son to take away our sins so that we can be forgiven so that we can be in a relationship of complete love and trust with him and when I first became a Christian I remember I understood the words but I was struggling with this idea and I remember thinking you know I think I would find it easier if Jesus hadn't died, if he had just suffered a little bit, because then perhaps I could be really obedient and deserve or own, earn um, this forgiveness. And I know that this is really Bible basics, um, and we understand it in our heads, but are we always walking in the receiving of it in our hearts. It's big and it's overwhelming and sometimes the vastness of it, the overwhelmingness of it makes us pull back from that. But the Bible is full of science-defying, completely illogical examples of God's love for us. Our gospel is based on radical, extravagant, vast love. We've just sung that we can't fathom how deep it is. But we don't need to fully understand it to receive it. You know, just as a baby on the breast doesn't need to understand how a baby doesn't need to understand the biology of how a mother's milk is made. The baby just knows that they need it and they seek it out. They feed and they are nourished and they rest in the goodness of it. And babies are wired to receive that milk. And we are created and wired and we yearn for God's love. In the chapter following the one we've just heard in 1 John 2, John writes... Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. We know the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But we can go further back, back from there, back to the beginning. And John's gospel starts... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. 
Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So long before even the first commandment was spoken, Jesus, the word, was with God, and, all, and through him all things were made. That life was the light of all mankind. So that spirit that was there at the beginning of creation that created the universe is the same spirit that lives within us. And we are spirit. Romans 8 tells us we are not in the realm of the flesh. We are in the realm of the spirit. So we were created from love made by God who is love and created for love. So that spirit of love is so fundamental and foundational to who we are. It's what we were created from. It's what we're wired for and it's what we yearn for. 1 John 4 says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. It's big. Songs, books, poetry, innumerable works of art have been created to celebrate love. Science has identified oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, hormones associated with love. We can even measure the chemical effects of love on the brain and in the body. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, gives the most beautiful description of love. None of those things can come even close to capturing all that love is. The vastness, the wholeness, all that is good in us and all that is good in the world, we can trace back to love. It's deep, deep within us and it has a recognizable quality that even when it's buried under sin, under difficult circumstances, under, under lack, neglect, we recognize it. Love speaks to us. It's the deep in us, reaching out to the deep in him, the one who created us. It's vast, it's deep, it's mysterious. It's overwhelming. And we can't quantify all that love is in words or science or pictures. But we don't need to do that to receive it. If we want to reduce love to an equation, that equation would be God is love. God equals love. And the access... To that, the doorway to that love is his forgiveness. 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. These are really simple words. But to take on board the vastness of this, we have to sit in the mystery that is God, the mystery that is love. No one can um, receive God's love for us. We can't receive forgiveness by proxy. We can't receive God's love on someone else's behalf. And God's love has nothing to do with coming to church. It's not about the conferences we go to or the podcasts we listen to. It's not about which rotors we're on to serve. It's not even about how much we can quote from the Bible. It's about our union with Jesus. It's about me and Jesus you and Jesus. It's that inner life with Jesus. 
And the deeper that union, the closer we walk with the perfect light that he is, the more his love and power can operate in us and through us. But to go deeper with him, to allow more of his light to shine in us and through us, we have to allow him to bring out of the shadows our sin. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Test yourselves. And if we choose to do that, to examine ourselves, to look at our nature, to examine our motives, the measure that we use for that test is love. We look at our motives, our nature, and we can ask, am I operating from love? Am I walking in the light? Are my words and actions motivated by love? And when we do that, that can be challenging and unraveling. Earlier this year, at one of the hungry sessions in June, Peter Doherty was talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And as he was talking, and in the prayer time that followed, I felt a deep sense of grief and a need to repent. Because I felt God was showing me that sometimes I have sought to seek the gifts of the Spirit over intimacy with Jesus. At times, I have treated Jesus like a sugar daddy. I have been a bride who wanted a powerful groom so that I could use his riches rather than wanting to have a relationship with the groom himself. In times of crisis, I've leaned deep into closeness with Jesus Because I've wanted my prayers answered. And God, in his kindness and mercy, has been faithful time and time again. But that's not walking in the light. You know, it's not walking in the light if when the crisis is over, we scuttle back to the shadows. What kind of union is that? What kind of bride wants the the bridegroom for his power and authority, but doesn't actually prioritize spending time with him. Jesus wants a bride who wants to get to know, not just all about him, but get, wants to get to know him, what he thinks, what he feels about everything. He wants a bride that is walking with him day by day, moment by moment, together in union. God is merciful, but too often we let crises be the reason we go deep. We have enough faith to get our prayers answered, to survive and scrape by, instead of pursuing a daily walking in the light. But truly walking in the light offers us offers us an an access to a higher realm of God's goodness. There is more. There's always more. There's momentum. When we walk in the light, there's more. And God wants us to have it. Not just on a Sunday morning. Not just at a worship event or a conference. Not just in our quiet time, alone with him, but always abiding. Walking in the light is a continuous relationship, a union. And so often I need reminding of that. Yesterday I read this quote by Mike Bickle. To abide in love means to continually live in it. 
This requires that we focus on living in God's love. We set our hearts to go deep in the holding or understanding of this. We must be students of God's emotions and grow in understanding God's multifaceted love. You know, in times of pressure, we have accelerated conversations with God in the valleys and in the mountains as well. We humans seek something outside ourselves. But the light is available in the plains, in the busyness, in the times of monotony, and leaning into and living into that place of union awakens us to God's availability to us. That union in the everyday It keeps his song in our hearts. You know, that's what we hear over the noise of life. And that becomes the soundtrack that we walk to. And it's that place, that union, that is the place of his promises. It's there that the Bible becomes alive. It becomes literally true. And we can live in that as an everyday reality. John tells us why he's writing these words about sin and forgiveness and living in the light. He says, we write this to make our joy complete. The Passion Translation says, we are writing these things to you so that you may fully share our joy. He's discovered this and he wants to share share it. He is the light. We have, sorry, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's good news. So if we walk in the light, we're purified. And then, of course, we have fellowship with one another. The more we allow the light the Christ in us, to grow and expand, the more we see the light in others. God wants us to enter into what he feels about others. He wants us to see their value, their beauty. He gives us a lens to see others as he sees them, through their sin and into the light in them. We receive forgiveness so that we can enter into the love, but we receive forgiveness so that we can extend forgiveness to others. And any obstacles to us receiving forgiveness and the love of God will prove to be an obstacle in us releasing that love and that forgiveness to others. When we feel overwhelmed with emotional baggage, feelings of bitterness or compromise or self-hatred, we can't love Jesus or others well. When we follow the first commandment, the second commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself, is a natural following. It's an overflow from this. And the more we walk in the light, the more we have fellowship with one another. And then... Fellowship has the very real potential to expand our ability to walk in the light. Fellowship with one another brings support, inspiration. It can challenge us to evolve and grow. We can both give and receive encouragement. We have the privilege of lifting each other in prayer. And when we find each other difficult as Sometimes we can because we are broken and complex and flawed, as well as being lovely and moving into perfection. These differences and difficulties can give us the opportunity to grow in love and we can surprise ourselves by extending our boundaries of grace. I'm not pretending that because I'm standing here talking about this, that this is my everyday, 
all day reality. If anything, preparing these words and the last year in general have highlighted to me just how dim my particular walk is. I'm very aware that there is so much more. I feel like a tiny battery-powered plastic tea light that when it's placed with hundreds of other little tea lights can make a nice glow, but my battery doesn't last and it's not replaced regularly enough. There's often a loose connection. And if this little light of mine was kicked away from the rest of the group, it would be barely noticeable. It's a minuscule version, my version is a minuscule version of the real deal. The real deal is the light that's powered constantly, constantly powered by God's love. And the power of that source of light is greater than the sun. The power of that source of light created the sun and that's the light I want to be walking in I want that version because that light is powerful consistent transformative and that light is available for all of us wherever we feel we're at in our walk Whatever our circumstances, whatever our sin has been, whatever our sin is right now in our lives, God wants all of us to walk in the light with him. In this year, which has been a difficult one, I have had a growing awareness of God's availability to resource me moment by moment. You know, there's been times when I found it really painful and sad to look back to the past because there's been loss and there is regret. And looking to the future has been extremely challenging and painful because of the uncertainty that's there. So I found my safe place is to be with God in the right now, in this moment. Because it's in the right now, in the present, that we can choose to raise our awareness of his presence. God has been with me in my past and he will be with me in my future. But right now, in this moment, he has everything that any of us need. And for me, sometimes the best way to walk in the light is to be still to turn my light to him, my my heart to him, to lean into him and know that he is God. I just invite you now, as I'm speaking, just turn your heart, your attention to him now, if you would like to, lean into him. Emmanuel. God is with us. We'll be taking communion later. But he's here now. His spirit is here. And we can let him draw from the shadows anything that might be causing us to miss the mark. Anything that's stopping us from walking in the light. And as we release that to him, as we repent and return to the high place, we can step into forgiveness and into his love. John called himself the beloved. And beloved 
is a name God gives to each and every one of us. It might be a name that you feel really comfortable with, that you deeply know that you are the beloved of God. It might be a title that doesn't quite resonate in your heart yet. But you are his beloved. It's not just John the beloved or Malcolm the beloved or Paula the beloved. It's you the beloved. And he's inviting each and every one of us into more. He's inviting us to walk in the light.